Welcome back to Writer's Toolkit. This episode is going to be all about the resources that you can use, and I'll be sure to include the links down below just to make sure that everybody can have access to these if they want them. I've got two sort of subcategories here. One of them is the offline resources that I'll actually be able to show you without cutting away. <laughs> so the first subcategory here is the offline tools. Um, these are the ones that I tend to go after, along with a couple that I'm sort of maybe dipping my toe into a little bit. So first is probably the best Christmas present I have ever gotten ever, which was from my parents who are awesome and supportive and were surprised when I started writing because I could actually sit still for that long to actually write something down. So it's the Writer's Digest magazine. These things have helped enormously because there's a workshop section in the back that I don't care what genre you write, I don't care what form you write in, and by form I mean like short story, if you're a novelist, if you're a poet, they always have something that you can actually like learn from back there that is explained by other writers of that genre that you can actually respect and learn from and go and find their stuff somewhere. I have found it really really helpful, I have found it really interesting to go and look at what other genres are doing. Like I have mentioned before, I am a fantasy writer, so I don't do a whole lot of research about locations. I don't... There, there's not a whole bunch of real life that ends up in my book. But Writer's Digest has actually been able to teach me a lot more than any creative writing class I've ever taken was able to. The next sort of thing is like textbooks and technical manuals. So the only grammar book that you should really care about, as far as I'm concerned anyway, is The Elements of Style by William Strunk and E.B. White. Um, it's this tiny, tiny little book. Like, let's just take a quick gander at how many pages it is, not including the index. Let's see, cut the glossary. It's not what I care about. Yeah, no, 85 pages of actual content for this thing. You have an index in the back so you can look up specific sorts of things. You have a glossary if you just forgot the definition to something. It's okay, we all do it. Another sort of thing that you want to look at are like technical manuals for a whole bunch of sort of role-playing games. Um, I don't necessarily play them. Like, I've never had a chance to play a role-playing ca game, which is kind of funny considering, unless werewolves count, that's really fun. But because of my boyfriend, who basically reads nothing but technical manuals because that's what he finds interesting, I am not that person, that is all him, but he has a huge collection of Pathfinder books. And these are only the physical ones that Michael has ascending into the abyss. Just the physical ones. He has a whole bunch of them in PDF on his laptop. Um, those have also been really, really helpful in terms of, like, particularly the bestiaries for me, because I operate in a fantasy world, I wanted characters to be not necessarily the run-of-the-mill, like, dragon, elf, dwarf kinds of things. Like, I wanted more interesting, less well-known creatures in my story. Um, I didn't necessarily 100% succeed at that, but, you know, that's kind of how it goes sometimes. So, um, another thing that you might want to consider looking at are some of these sort of on writing books. I personally have three different ones. I have Stephen King's On Writing, I have Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird, which has also come in handy because that wasn't a signed textbook for me. But. <laughs> and then one of the ones that I find the best for fantasy writers is this one by Terry Brooks. Um, some of you might know him because he's the author of the Shannara series, but this is Lessons from a Writing Life, Sometimes the Magic Works. This goes through his entire journey of writing the Shannara series and working in fantasy, which there are not a whole lot of fantasy sorts of books out there that talk about the process and world building and all this other stuff 
that is super critical for speculative fiction in general. And for those of you who don't know what speculative fiction is, that's the umbrella term for like science fiction, fantasy, um, I think mysteries in there. Another sort of textbooky kind of thing that you might want to look at, I'm going to show you two. Um, one of them was given to me by a friend of mine from dance who thought I might appreciate it, but I still haven't actually gotten around to reading it. Sorry, this was like three years ago. But it is the 24th annual collection edition of the year's best science fiction, edited by Gardner Dozoi, I guess is how you say that. It's a huge anthology. Um, I don't actually read a whole lot of science fiction, so that's why this hasn't gotten read. But taking a look at short stories can also help with scene crafting. It can help with um, sort of sub arcs to your main story arc. And having anth anthologies like this, um, I have another one that's strictly fantasy stuff. Having access to anthologies can really help with sort of educating some of your choices, it can help with educating some of the, I'm going to use the gaming term here, mechanics of your work. It can sort of also just like give you a quick sec to get out of your own headspace, put everything on the back burner, and just read something. Because as writers we tend to read and study a thing at the same time. Um, especially if it's in our genre, if it's something that we really, really love to read and we've read it more than once, because the first time is always just for pleasure. The second time and everything after, that is when you start sort of picking things apart and studying like how this author crafted their story and how they handled time jumps and all this other stuff that sort of happens, especially when you have to do summary stuff. Um, the other one I just got because a friend of my boyfriend handed it off to him for me because he's also starting to get more serious about his writing. He wanted to get a little information on publishing. Um, so this one actually is a Writer's Digest book, which actually makes it, me trust it a bit more because I've had the Writer's Digest subscription for years now. Um, it is the 2015 Writer's Market sort of manual. <laughs> it's really, really big. Um, but that goes into all of, like, the, here's how to get an agent, here's a bunch of agents in your area, here's how you go about doing self-publishing without getting screwed over, which that's the section that I need to read because that's the path I'm going. It's really getting into the after you've written your book details that tend to get overlooked somewhat. And then the last sort of offline thing, which for me it's kind of in a like nether zone, because <laughs> I'm going to show you a little bit of the printed out version, but I actually do this on my computer, like the little laptop that I showed you in the last video. This is my sort of personal information tracker for the book. Like the first page on here, which probably looks super fabulous, even though you can't really see detail on it in the camera. This is the world map that I'm dealing with for this, like late in the second book. And it's got very, very faint lines on it, probably from the camera's point of view, that go through that book's main character's trade route, along with like, here's how long this leg takes, and here's how long this leg takes, and a whole bunch of little detail and map key at the bottom. And then I have calendars. Um, the one that's in here currently is only for book two. And then country list with nationalities and capital cities and important locations outside of capital cities. Character groupings from the first two books. I, I am very, very information retentive, especially about stuff that's for my own story. This is an example of the sort of character sheets that I've worked up. Obviously I've made a few edits here. There are more edits that have happened since I made these notes. 
but I wanted to show you her because her name's not changing. But yeah, so I have a printout version that's kind of crappy compared to the Excel spreadsheet that I have on my mini laptop, but that's kind of just how it is. So if, if you want a template of that, I'm afraid you're going to have to wait a significant amount of time because I actually have to get it up onto a website. Uh, maybe I can put it on my Facebook page. I'm not sure yet, but the templates will definitely be up on my website once it gets put up, which is going to be a while because it actually has to be built first. Yes, I know there are websites out there where you can buy websites and build them on there, but the boyfriend is very much wanting to build it for me. So that's going to be a while. Now, the first two websites that I use, they are sibling sites and you can get to either one from the other, which is really, really handy. And they are name etymology sites. So it goes into the definitions of names, like what the name means, and it goes into sort of like the history of the name. Like there are names on there that this name was invented by Shakespeare because it showed up in this play and before then it didn't really exist and things along those lines. Behind the name is just first slash middle names and it goes into a lot of detail about things and it's very, very easy to use. You can search it specifically by gender, you can search it specifically by country of origin. This is what the homepage looks like. Um, you can do a lot more exploring once you actually get onto the site, but here are some of the tools that are available and here is the main URL. Again, I'll include this in the description below. Uh, that's the behind the name website. And then behind the surname.com does a lot of the same things that the behind the name site does. As you can see, the surname website is set up very similarly. We also have the tools button here, though it mostly just links back to the original site. That one I find easier to deal with as an internet source because it's a lot harder to get sidetracked there. But at the same time, it is on the internet. There are sort of dark holes that you fall into going like, what does this name mean? And how does this relate to this one? And ah! it's fine. <laughs> it's not like the third sort of online resource that I use because those of you who have an account on this website, you know just how distracting it, it is and how very easy it is to just sit there and click buttons all day. And yes, I'm talking about Pinterest. So I've been putting my Pinterest page into the descriptions. I'm probably going to keep doing that for a really long time. I keep my boards really, really organized. Like I have them in alphabetical order. So when you get to the bottom ish of my page, there is a whole block of Pinterest boards that have the prefix writing. There's a whole bunch of different little categories of writing things because they're, if I put them all on one board, you're never going to be able to find anything. Like, I'm not able to find things. And here we have what my Pinterest page looks like. Um, we've got the URL that's always been in the description. We've got a lovely Regal by Blood uh, board that has a bunch of sort of reference material that I've got on there. And then we have all of these lovely little writing based boards. Um, you can explore those at your leisure later and I hope that you find at least some of it helpful. For online sources, I also have a few online doll makers bookmarked. Um, and that is more for ironing out character design than anything else. Even if there's not a whole lot of variation in body type it can still help to go like, okay, with these minor tweaks, this is what this character looks like. And that can be really, really helpful. So that's about it for the resources video. I hope it was helpful. Uh, I will see you next time for the next segment. See ya.